Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today I have two invitations for you. If you've listened to this show before, you've heard me say that September 15th through 17th, I will be speaking at a big afterlife symposium in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I'd love to come you to come and uh, meet me in person. It's going to be a great event filled with current state-of-the-art information of why life, life after death is real, how to connect with your loved ones, and even how to get ready for our an- end-of-life transition. So come meet me. You can find out more at afterlifestudies.org to find out more or to register. Now, the second thing, this is the first announcement, we have a brand new Facebook group for our listeners. There are thousands out in cyber world that are listening to this show, and I am so grateful that you spend your time listening. So if you are a Facebook member, type in your search box, We Don't Die Listeners. And why this group is important is if you're anything like me, and I think you are, we're looking for friends that are like-minded, that are interested in this conversation, and we can talk more about this. And I know many people do comment in Uh, on YouTube under the episodes, but this way we can actually have a conversation. So I'll be actively involved. And so I'd love for you to be there. And it is a closed group, meaning you'll have to request to be part of it. Of course, I'm going to say yes. Uh, But then at that point, you can also put your friends in it as well and share it. Okay, so I want to keep it sort of private. So today on the show, I am excited to welcome back Dr. Roy Hill. Roy, you may remember from episode number 98. Roy has worked as a psychologist in corrections, both at both as a clinician and supervisor for over 20 years. However, he has been passionately studying near-death experiences and has, in fact, studied over 4,000 of them. And he wrote the book, Psychology and the Near-Death Experience, Searching for God. So I do encourage you to listen to episode 98, as it is a fascinating conversation how this book came about. But today... Roy will be talking about his brand new book, and it's called Jesus and the Near-Death Experience. And I can only imagine that this is going to be a great conversation. So, Dr. Roy Roy Hill, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you very much, Sandra. It's great to be with you again. Oh, it's so nice to have you. It's been a while, over a year. Yeah. Yes. Time goes by yes. quick. It does. Very quick. And you've been very busy at the keyboard typing out a new book. (laughs) I have. Yeah. Maybe, Roy, you could just start off, because some of our listeners have not heard episode 98, but just give uh, maybe a condensed version of um, a bit of your background and how you even got into the world of studying near-death experiences. I'm a psychologist by training and grew up in a very scientific household with some smattering of religion um, with that. So near-death experiences are somewhat new to me. It happened after I had a spiritually transformative experience working in the prison system. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So I had an inmate who was on suicide watch because his sister had passed away. And after a couple of days, he said he was better because his sister was talking to him. And I thought to myself, you know, more psychosis. But he said, no, sister is telling him that he didn't be on suicide watch, that she was with him, and that everything was going to be okay. I said, this doesn't sound like any auditory hallucination that I'm aware of. Usually they're negative and cryptic and never helpful. Mm-hmm. So I took him off watch under the watch of, of the unit officer and saw him the next day and asked him if he was hearing stuff from his sister. And he said, yes. And I said, well, what is your sister telling you? And he said, well, she's telling me that you don't believe me, and so you shall believe. He's got a message for you. And I said, what's that? And he said, quarter. Like quarter of the coin or quarter of something full. And I said, quarter of the coin. He says, what does that mean? He says, I don't know. So the next inmate who comes in, as ranting about the hypocrisy in the United States. Hmm. And he asked me, Dr. Hill, do you know what's written on a quarter? And I said, in God we trust. And I said, wow, nobody's asked that for me before or since. So I talked to the other guy, of course, and, and he goes, 
um, that uh, he was pretty surprised. And I asked him, is his sister selling, selling him anything else? And he said, yes. He says that you're going to have a son and he's going to be born on Christmas Day. And indeed, my wife was pregnant, and I knew it was going to be a boy, but would he be born on Christmas Day? Well, he was born on January 7th. And that really bothered me for about 11 years. And then I thought to myself with epiphany, wow, that first there was a declaration that I didn't have faith. Mm -hmm. Then there was a statement I needed to trust in God. Maybe this was a test of faith somehow. So in a leap of faith... I Google Christmas Day and January 7th, knowing full well, as everybody else does, that Christmas Day is on December 25th. Right. And lo and behold, a lot of stuff comes up. Turns out that Christmas Day, according to the Gregorian or Christian calendar, is on January 7th. And it's a calendar that uh, Christendom used to use, and now the Orthodox Church still uses it. Mm -hmm. But we now use the uh, Julian calendar. So, so, well, what do I do with that? My Christian friends say, well, you know, hey, dog, be careful. You don't know where this is from. It's probably from the devil. Right. And I thought to myself, how can a message of trusting in God be from the devil? So I knew about near-death experiences, and so I started to comb the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation website, where there's about 4,000 anonymous cases. And I read and read and read. And I corresponded with the owners of the website, the Longs, and they encouraged me to write a book, which I did, and that's how I got started with it all. Mm. What's the website that you were on to do all this research? A Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, or NDERF. NDERF, yeah, I think we talked about that on the, on the first episode, mm-hmm. but I know there's some new listeners that would be very interested in checking that out. Yes, awesome website. So the story continues that you, I mean, you did a lot of research. I did. I did. I, really what, what I was interested in is looking at all the different connections between your death experiences. And what I found was is they're remarkably the same. Imagine if you were um, a jury and somebody said, um, you know, I, I saw so and so smash and grab a television set from that store. If you had one person say it, you might throw it out. If mm-hmm. you had a hundred people observe the same thing, then any jury in the world would probably convict uh, the defendant. Right. What if 15 million people saw that? There's no jury in the world who would not convey for that because 15 billion people, it was a no-brainer. Right. It has to be true. In the United States alone, about 15 million people, or about 5% of the population, has had a near-death experience. In the United States alone, 15 million. That's correct. So wow. the surveys in the world ranges from 3 to 7%, 5% being about the average and and that's some of those near death experiences were not deep near death experiences. Some were very brief. Uh, some some were just out of body experiences. Still, you cannot stop a force like that transforming and changing the world. And when I was going through all these near death experiences, I realized that I said, "Wow, this is a, there's a spiritual awakening happening in the world, and behind some of it." Our near-death experiences. Yes, exactly. So the first book, what do you tell people the first book's about? Psychology and the near-death experience, searching for God. Well, I use a lot of psychology to help understand some of the spiritual aspects of near-death experiences. Uh, Sensation perception, for instance. What is consciousness like when we die? How is it different than when we are alive? It's very similar, but very much expanded. So I talk about that quite a bit. I talk about love as being a central force of to learn how to love. And that is basically the central 
life. Um, if anybody has wondered what the meaning of life is, come to the right show today, at least according to near-death experiences, it's quite simple. It's to learn what we lack in love. And that's why we come and we struggle and we deal with difficult things because we learn most through adversity. And um, we may shake, shake our fist at God and say, why did you bring me this terrible life or these terrible things that are happening? And the answer is because you chose it. Wow. You chose these things to learn how to love. Yeah, that's what I thought. Wow. Mm. Um, it, it just brings a whole new awareness to what we value is important sure. and what is important. We think an easy life, a, a very comfortable life, filled with things and friends, and and um, and we work so hard to try to avoid um, difficulties. When in truth, difficulties will come because. There's some of the things we need to learn in life, some of the hard lessons um, on here on school earth. It's so true, Roy. I just, I, I, I don't like hearing the words that we learn most through adversity. And I often say, because so, so many people have said, you know, it's our suffering that brings us the greatest growth. You know, I hate to say it, but it it's the truth. Even looking back on my life or anyone listening, looking back on their life, uh, you know, if something was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it's just like, it was horrific. However, this is what I learned out of it. And this is how I increased my capacity to love or have compassion or whatever that may be. Absolutely. We learn that love, it sounds simple, but love is anything but simple. It's very difficult. Love means learning how to sacrifice for other people. Mm -hmm. It means how to uh, forgive other people or to have inherent respect for people. You know, to have inherent respect, it's easy to have an inherent respect for a friend, but what about the homeless person? Yes. It's easy to forgive a friend or a close loved one who says something mean, but what if somebody leaves you, you know, and, and uh, takes your stuff and abandons you, you know, somebody you trusted? How do you forgive that person? Or sacrifice, it's easy to sacrifice for a friend, if they need to move their furniture or what have you. But what about sacrificing for a parent who suffered from Alzheimer's and quitting your job for three or four years mm -hmm. to take care of that parent? Those are the difficult lessons of life where we learn truly how to love. True. I, question. Um, and I've heard this spoken many, many times that we choose to come into this earth to learn these lessons. Is that some of the things you found through researching near-death experiences? Absolutely. I learned that uh, we have always been and always will be. So eternity goes in both directions. Amazing. So at some point, we, we in, we, some point we individuated from the oneness, our true nature, which is of God, and became an individual. And through... Um, a cycle of stairway of lessons over time, we are learning more and more and more. And uh, in this life, we're learning a lot of things, but we chose this life to learn what we lack in love. So, you know, I think great thought from according to the meaning of your death experiences, great thought has been placed into what kind of life we were going to live but who what parents were going to be born into, you know, what sex we're going to be, what race, what neighborhood, what country, you know, on and on and on. All these variables were well thought out before it was chosen who we were going to be born to and what kind of life we were going to lead, live. You know, I think it's good news uh, if we can embrace it that way. I know it's easy for my negative mind to somehow get, sometimes get into victim mode. Woe is me. I can't believe this happened. You know, I hate my life. I don't say that, but it's really easy to fall into victim when bad things happen. And absolutely. And the good news is if we decide to sit in the driver's seat and try on the concept that we chose 
to be here to learn this. Um, and it's funny because even if you believe it or not, if you actually put yourself in those shoes, you know, you start seeing a problem as, you know, could call it an opportunity or what can I, what can I uh, get out of this? What can I learn from this? And I, I don't know about you, but it sure helps me get over <laughs> being in that victim mode pretty fast and um, gives me power in life. Absolutely. Very empowering. Very empowering. It's hard though, because human nature being as it is, we don't like to deal with adversity. You know, it's not give me a painful disease, please. Nobody prays that. No. People pray for health and for success and so forth. So I think it's a little unrealistic for us to be perfect in this. But even just having the knowledge that there are things to learn when bad bad events happen can help us struggle through it, I believe, mm. and give us a better perspective, even though um, I think it's unrealistic for anybody to to embrace it fully. Oh, absolutely. You know, we look for good in some situations, and sometimes it's like, I can't find any. So we just do the best we can, and I think having books to read, um, the things to look at the in the inter- on the internet, shows to listen to like this, they're all good constant reminders as to who we are as human beings, that we're not alone on this mm-hmm. journey, uh, puts us back into perspective. I, I can't have one of these interviews, Roy, without really putting my life into it as well. And uh, so sure. that, that's what I hope for everybody, that our lives are in it and, and we can start thinking about these concepts you know, for ourselves and empower ourselves. So I'm very interested, though, about Jesus and the near-death experience. I I know yes. from being the founder of this show and having so many conversations with people, and I get a lot of emails from listeners, and there's some people actually uh, afraid that they're going against religion by studying anything that has to do with the afterlife. You know, and, and my gut instinct is to kind of laugh at that because, of course, you know, we pray to beings that are no longer on this earth. Um, but I found it very interesting that the title of your book is Jesus and the Near-Death Experience. So, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about how, first of all, how did you get into um, this subject? Well, initially, I um, kept running across Jesus when I was reading through all these 4,000 near-death experiences. Uh, and the Longs, the people who run the Ender website, did some research, and the most viewed spiritual being during a near-death experience, the, the single most viewed being, is Jesus. Mm. Yet nothing is written about Jesus, at least in a book by itself about Jesus and near death experiences. Now there are many accounts of Jesus and near death experiences in books, but not there hasn't been a study of what Jesus is saying throughout all these hundreds and hundreds of near death experiences. Mm, so I thought, well, yeah, I thought, well, this is something new and different. And uh, anybody who wants is interested in near death experiences or or is a Christian uh, might want to read about this. Mm-hmm. So so I considered writing a book about Jesus, but I had some doubts. Uh, and my doubts stem from thousands of people who have written about Jesus over the last 2,000 years, a lot of religious scholars. And I kind of questioned whether I was qualified mm-hmm. to write a book about Jesus. It was a pretty tall order of magnitude to to attempt, Mm -hmm. in my mind. So I prayed about it, and I had a dream that I think answered my my question. If if I have a moment, I can describe it. Yes, we have all the time in the world. Okay. Uh, Well, I dreamt that I was in this church, and I say church loosely because it wasn't necessarily a Christian church. It was more of a sanctuary without any religious icons, Uh, but it looked like a bombed-out church that one might find after World War II in Germany, no roof, and, you know, the stained glasses was missing, it was empty. And around this church, there was just 
barren desert. Nothing was growing. And there were people lined up in this sanctuary, and I knew that they were trying to find inoculation from the spiritual death that surrounded the church. So there was life, spiritual life in the church, but it didn't look very um, thriving because there was no roof and and it looked bombed out. Uh-huh. So, uh, so people were lined up, and then there's these nurses that were giving them shots and that gave them seizures, but they survived. Now there were a few people who got the inoculation without the syringe uh, or the needle and the serum, and they did not seize. And then. Uh, eventually it was my turn and I, and that's what I got. I got the, um, I got the inoculation without the serum and I didn't see the people had the seizures woke up and were oblivious to why they were in pain, but they did survive. And I later realized that the inoculation was basically doctrine that people were receiving doctrine to find spiritual life and it was causing them a lot of pain but it also was keeping them spiritually focused and not and spiritually alive. And there were a few people who were receiving the inoculation without the doctrine and were spiritually alive without the pain. Then once everybody received their inoculation, they left the church to go out into the world and they left and I wanted to go with them. So I started leaving the church and I heard the words, you are Jesus. And I thought, Oh my goodness, you know, based on my religious background and doctrine, that's heresy. Mm -hmm. And I said, I am not Jesus. Uh, So I walked to the edge of the church, and the bottom of the church crumbled, like on the second floor, and it crumbled. And I was in midair, and I looked up, and there was an image of Jesus that came down. And he, oddly enough, as part of the dream goes, he was wearing a t shirt with a rainbow on it. Hmm. And he comes down, and about three feet from me, he that image transforms into just white light. And that white light enters me, and I start rotating three times. And each time I rotated, I heard the words, Jesus is heaven, heaven is Jesus. Jesus is heaven, and heaven is Jesus. Jesus is heaven, heaven is Jesus. And then the dream was over. Pretty wild dream, right? Yeah, and you remember it with clarity? I remember with clarity. Yes, I do. Yeah, most dreams you don't. <laughs> or I don't. Okay. <laughs> right, right. A lot of symbolic meaning behind it. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so then what? So I thought to myself, I have the answer. I'm to write about Jesus from the position of unity. From what I read, a lot of near-death experiences that Jesus really is 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 the son of God, but we're also sons and daughters of God because mm-hmm. Jesus is within us and we're also within Jesus. Just as Jesus is heaven and heaven is Jesus, we are also part of this tapestry. We are also part of this unity. And there's this tremendous unity that we cannot separate from each other. And... Um, the Gospel of Thomas, which I use quite a bit in my book, it's not in the Bible, but it's a, a very interesting book. Jesus said, I am the light of over them. That says, the all has come forth from me, and the all has attained unto me. Cleave a piece of wood, I am there. Raise up a stone, you should find me there. And that's where Jesus is heaven, and, and heaven is Jesus. And because we're unified with Jesus, we cannot separate ourselves from that either. And so the image of the rainbow conveyed that. If you read a lot of near-death experiences, you notice that there's this pervading white light in heaven. Yes. And if you think of frequencies, of every frequency, of all the endless frequencies of light, you put them all together, you get white light. Well, we cannot differentiate between all that white light because we cannot differentiate the mind of God because God is beyond comprehension. But what if you put that white light through a prism? What do you get? A rainbow. 
you get a rainbow. Exactly. So all the frequencies are are differentiated and individualized. So Jesus, God is is the white light. Jesus represents the rainbow of all light as well. So Jesus is sort of a mediator. So Jesus' frequency is every frequency, but it's 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 spread out individually. So Jesus understands your frequencies perfectly, and you can relate to Jesus perfectly. See how that works? I know this is a little convoluted and, and a little complicated, uh, but this is how I interpreted the image of Jesus in the rainbow. And indeed, I found a lot of, I would say a lot, I found some near-death experiences where they see Jesus as a person and they see Jesus as with a rainbow light in his eyes or around his body and so forth. Mm. So this is how, how I approached um, my writing and uh, went from there. I like it. I'm just looking and taking it in. Just God and Jesus, just everywhere in everything. You know, I do believe there's that we are all connected with this we are. loving light. And I think uh, many people may call it different names, but the true essence is, is remains the same. And just getting that visual of that white light through the prism, and there's not right. I mean, it includes every color, everything, every human, every animal, every stone, everything. Right. So one of my chapters, I talk about how Jesus relates to us based on near-death experiences. Okay. There are some people who relate to Jesus as a father. So um, for, for instance, uh, there's this, I'll read one to you. Okay. This is, as Jesus held me and looked into his eyes, I'll never forget how wonderful and awesome his eyes were. The first thing I asked him was, do you hate me because I'm a drug addict? And Jesus said, I will never forget, I will never forget what he said to me. No, I only want you to know that I love you. There other things said, and then he started to set me down. I said, please don't leave me. He said, I will never give you more than you can handle than I was back in my body. And the other person, another person said, the voice that he was Jesus and my father. I felt a tremendous sense of paternal love, which I found odd afterwards because he was brought up by a single parent. Mm -hmm. So then the voice who called himself Jesus asked me, well, why do you think you did? I paused and giggled and said, much like my school report, really, I could have done better. The voice said, so what do you want to do? So here's a a frequency of a father Mm -hmm. that these two individuals uh, approached and saw Jesus as a father, but a father who was a perfect father, a father who did not condemn, and the father who gave free will, Mm -hmm. and a father who had unconditional love even to the drug addict. Julian and Norwich who had a near-death experience 700 years ago, saw Jesus as a mother. Near-death experience 700 years ago? Did you just say that? Yes. Can you back up? What what are you talking about? I don't know of any near-death experiences other than the ones that we've got written in, well, somewhat recent time, within the last 100 years or so. Well, even Plato wrote about a near-death experience. He was talking about her, so... Um, and the Apostle Paul in the Bible, he talked about his near-death experience in Corinthians, where he was stoned to death in Lystra. Really? He didn't describe much about it. Yeah, so near-death experiences go way, way back. Now, there are more of them these days, and part of it is because we have the medical technology to mm-hmm. resuscitate people. Um, but there may be other reasons as well why we're having them more now. But Julian of Norwich uh, was a woman who's an anchoress in England at the Abbey of Norwich. No, nobody knows her true name. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. But, but in any case, she wrote the first book in the English language by a woman about the time of Chaucer, about 1390s. And she wrote about her near-death experience. And um, she's considered one of the greatest Christian mystics um, that have ever lived. And But when I read it, she even described how she died. So I said, this is not just Christ- Christian mysticism, this is a near-death experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful book. And she had a near-death experience involving Jesus. So And she wrote a very long book about it. Um, But anyway, she saw Jesus as a mother. When I talked about facing adversity and learning and making mistakes, there's a restoration that happens, Mm -hmm. and there's a growth that happens, and we're doing this spiral of lessons. And so if you think about a mother in terms of a nurturer and helping a little child grow and become more than they are, and loving them through each step of the way, and that's how she saw Jesus. So there's a frequency of Jesus that's different than the Father frequency. And, of course, there are many people who see Jesus as a brother. Um, Here's here's one for that. I asked, what is your relationship to me? Jesus said, I am your brother. Next I asked, I know that's what the Bible says, so it's true then. Jesus said, yes, I am your brother. We have the same blood running through your veins. I will never leave or forsake you. I will always be there and never forget who you are. This goes back to the unity that we're all equals. Mm -hmm. Is Jesus more important than you or me? Does God love Jesus more than you or me? It's easy to say, God can't love me very much because I make a lot of mistakes. But does a parent love a toddler more than an older brother who's maybe 17, even though the toddler is smearing food all over his face? (laughs) No, a good parent loves the toddler as much as a 17-year-old. And God loves us as much as Jesus because we're all part of God. We're all part of this unity. So there was a one I really liked. A Jewish doctor had a near-death experience and saw Jesus. Wow, okay. Yeah, and he says, I merely walked over to him and asked, Are you the being called Jesus? With a warm, soft sense of love and laughter, he replied back, I am called by many names. However, because of your background, you can call me Big Brother, and I will call you my little Prince of Peace. This is what Jesus told this this guy. Mm -hmm. And notice Jesus didn't say, "I, I, uh, you, you know, look at me. Here I am. You were wrong. You know, you should have worshipped (laughs) me, the Son of God, in the hotel." Didn't say anything like that, but rather understood where this doctor was coming from and presented himself as a big brother, as equals, but yet more mature. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. And I I think those are different ways that Jesus can present, uh, three, three examples of ways that Jesus can present to us. But there could be many others as a savior, as as um, a healer, on and on and on. Roy, I think many people have this fear that when we die, um, there's going to be somebody who's judging us in this near-death experience. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe Jesus' role Well, I have yet to read a near-death experience where Jesus was judging us. So I really want to try to help people's fears in this. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm treading on dangerous waters here. Yeah, do it. Do it anyways. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the thing is, one thing I do encourage of listeners, even of myself— that we have to look for what re- resonates with us, with our truth, 
You know, I mean, there might be people that don't believe in Jesus at all, and you know, they're, but they're listening to this conversation just to see, you know, what what is that power for you? You know, that being, and and so just, you know, I, right. my encouragement to you is just share it because I think each one of us, our souls, can take. And the truth resonates within us, you know, those things that empower us. So you feel free to share right. that, that you're, that I can't imagine what you're going to share, but go for it. We're all learning through adversity and through good things too, as mm-hmm. I said, that is the meaning of our life down here. So we are saved through our, the emulation of Jesus or those types of where if somebody is not a follower of Jesus, then um, we can emulate Jesus-like qualities without even following Jesus explicitly. But the purpose of Jesus coming to this earth, and Howard Storm had asked Jesus, have you been to other planets? He said, I've been to every planet throughout space and time. Certainly not as Jesus, but as some form familiar to whatever species that. Mm -hmm. So it it seems like there seems to be a archetype, uh, a a procedure when a species gets to a certain level where God presents God-like qualities in a way that that species can understand. Mm -hmm. And to have an example, to have a model for how to live. And I think that Jesus saves us through being that model. It saves us from becoming lost from our true self, the true divinity within. Now, the consequences of not following that model is not uh, hell, eternal hell. And I know this goes against the traditional Christian thought, but let me put it this way. Sandra, would you, if you had a choice, take your worst enemy and and send that person to to be tortured eternally because you don't like them or what they did to you? No. No, I wouldn't either. And I would guess that many of your listeners wouldn't either. The point being is that if our love is immature and God's love is perfect, would it, what kind of hypocrisy would it be if God took the majority of human beings who do not, who are not saved and torture them eternally in hell because they don't believe in a certain way? Right. It just doesn't make sense to me. A God with pure, unconditional love wouldn't be torturing people eternally without any chance of, of, of redemption. So I, I would say that Jesus saves us in a different way. Jesus saves us because it helps us to grow and to become more than who we are in, this, in the spiral of steps of our own ascension. Mm-hmm. Roy, do we, I don't want to say judge ourselves, but do we get to see the impact our life has had during a near-death experience? Absolutely. Many people have what we call life reviews. And during those life reviews, we see not, what, not only what we have done to other people and re-experience them in full, but we get to experience it from their point of view as well. So if we really hurt somebody by something we say, we get to actually feel what the person felt when we said it to them. Because in unity, what we do to others, we do to ourselves. Mm -hmm. How about the good things we do? Do we get to experience those? The same thing, the same thing. And oftentimes there's a commentator, not always, sometimes there's no commentator, but sometimes there's a commentator who said, well, what could you have done different? Or did you do well? Did you, you know, did, how, how did this, how did what you do make this person feel really good? 
so on and so on. But yet there's no sense of judgment in terms of punishment or that a person is better or worse because of what they did. The only person during a life you judging is oneself. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of times when people come back, they don't, they may, may not like everything that happened during their life review. And so they're very highly motivated to do better and paid more attention to how they treat other people. Interesting you say that. I've spoken to tons of people that have had a near-death experience and very interesting how the lives that get turned around and also uh, all of them have made their lives about service and helping their fellow man or woman, mankind. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a very common theme. Many people give up their lucrative career to change life paths and become hospice and work in hospice mm-hmm. or nursing or clergy or mental health or something along those lines mm. in the helping professions in one way or the other that's very common yeah roy i just got a visual in my mind of i don't remember the quote but i was just thinking about jesus the different representations uh when people have a near-death experience but um i'm going to butcher the quote so sorry about that but it's got something to do with the light that emanates from a lamp. And all around the world, of course, there's all kinds of different lamps, but the light remains the same. So I can see from a near-death perspective, you know, all the different cultures, all the different people, all the different beliefs. Um, We might have these different lamps, (laughs) so to speak, but that true light and who that true light is, is the same. Does that make sense? It is the same. Yeah. And and the wonderful thing about the unity of everything, the unity of God, is that people can find truth through different religions Mm -hmm. and uh, find truth in uh, their search for God. If if it's based on love, it's going to translate into growth. Mm -hmm. So... One does not have to be a follower of Jesus or a believer in Jesus to grow right. uh, spiritually. In fact, I think many of us are born in parts of the world um, to have a different type of experience. So, although to me, I'm a Christian because of what Jesus represents, not only through the Bible, but through near-death experiences, mm-hmm. I also realize that other people can have meaningful spiritual growth and experiences out of love and become closer to God uh, f- with very different paths. And many people kind of, when they have a near-death experience, they, they ask, in fact, Howard Storm asked, asked Jesus, what is the right religion? He didn't say Christianity. He said, whatever religion brings you closest to God. Mm-hmm which is very interesting that Jesus would said that. Hmm. So I think, I think that should give people pause. If, if, but if one is a follower of Jesus, there is a great rich wealth of material, I think in the Bible and other places, such as the gospel of Philip and the gospel of Thomas and uh, Julian of Norwich and near death experiences uh, and many other sources, I think, to uh, really grow spiritually. Roy, do you have any advice for people who have been told, this is including myself, raised a Catholic girl, now that I'm involved in all this afterlife business, there's um, there's a lot of people that are very judgmental that I am doing something against God and Jesus by doing this. Now, I don't believe any of us are, but uh, do you have something you've said to people? Or do you just walk away from a conversation if someone says something like that? Well, in my experience, people um, need doctrine. And Mm -hmm. just like in my, my dream that I explained earlier in the program, Doctrine has a place in helping people connect with 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 God, but it also causes 
a lot of pain and hurt towards other people, I think, too. But people who are very steeped and need their doctrine Mm -hmm. need to have a point of view where they're special with God and that they have the answer, uh, where there's no ambiguity. That gives them a great source of meaning and um, an anchor. It gives them an anchor, uh, which they can rest their belief in God from. Part of me is very reticent to take that away from people. Um, And I also, in my experience, found that people do not, are not open um, for the most part, who are people who who really need their doctrine Mm -hmm. uh, to other points of view. Uh, they can become very um, angry and resentful sure. and attack. So I tend not to engage in a lot of conversations with uh, people who are, are embrace doctrine to a great degree. Uh, at the same time, I respect some of their doctrine. Uh, raised a Christian, mm-hmm. um, I find much of their teaching to be of great value and things that I accept, but I just see it in in, in an expanded way. You know, I'm reminded of a fortune cookie I got once. It just simply said the best place to stand in an argument is in the other person's shoes. And I think that could be taken on as far as uh, anybody, you know, we, gosh, I know I've talked to people that are so skeptical and anti-life after death that, you know, they want to have a big battled, heated conversation, you know, and I won't do it. Uh, <laughs> but I also think some people, you know, really steeped in their doctrine too. If we took on the, uh, I remember the magic, there was a magic eight ball, but there, and there was also a Jesus that you could shake and it, you know, what would Jesus do kind of thing? And to right. really love people no matter where they're at. Uh, and if we can see life through the perspective of their past, their belief, what they grew up with, we could have compassion and, and just really respect everybody for where they're at. And I know I'm one person that I don't push my stuff on anybody. You know, I might put out a little teaser line to see if somebody's interested um, in the afterlife. You know, I wrote, I wrote a book about this and, you know, they'll, they'll take the bait or they won't. You know, and that's okay. But to respect everybody. Right. And I would add to that. Very good. Okay. I, I agree with that fully. But add to that, respect your own beliefs. Yes. Yes. Because everybody has a fundamental right to have their own beliefs, own spiritual beliefs, whatever that may be. Nobody has the right to take that away from you. And you don't have the right to take it away from somebody else. You can share your beliefs if people are interested, Mm -hmm. but whatever your spiritual beliefs are is a sacred interaction between you and the divine. Mm -hmm. And it is your path, and I think it's a sacred path, and it can evolve, it can change, Uh, it may not be... um, fully of truth, cause, but who knows what truth is. Exactly. But I, but I, I think, I think it, it, it's, it's the process of, of growing and searching that's important, and it's the love and it's the connection to, to the divine that's important, to, and to express that, that connection with the divine by loving others. Mm-hmm. And I think the greatest commandment in the Bible that Jesus said is true. The greatest commandment is love your God with all your heart and equally love your neighbors as yourself. And um, I think that that remains true whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. Loving other people is where it's at. That's the whole point, again, of our life here is to learn what we lack in love and try to love. If we love other people more fully and unconditionally, to be more forgiving, to be more respectful, uh, to be willing to sacrifice for each other, 
um, to be humble in, in, in the way we do things out of love, out of, of love for others, then we can't really go wrong. No. We're on the right path. And I love the path. It's interesting because, you know, how they always say life is about the journey, not the destination. I found per- find personally this discovery that I am on, and it is a personal discovery with my own beliefs. It's like building a relationship uh, with wh- whoever we call God, Jesus, the universe, whatever that may be. But it's very special between me and the light is what I'm going to say. And the more time that passes and the more great things that happen. And I I mean, it's my truth. It's my journey. And as we all have one, and and it's to really respect that. I love that you said that. Respect our own beliefs. And, and, um, and I wouldn't trade this journey in for anything. And I really wouldn't. And also to be able to share it. Absolutely. Mm. Roy, we just have a few minutes left. What else do you want to share about the book, yourself, what you're up to, how to get in touch with you, all that kind of thing? Something I might should have asked you and I didn't. So reach inside you and see well, what else there um, is to say. I, uh, I've been enjoying doing events throughout different parts of the country, different conferences, and talking about near-death experiences. And, Wonderful. Uh, um, I... Uh, Enjoy any feedback people have for my book. I do have a website. Tell us what that it's, is. Uh, yes, it's near death exp psy dot com. Perfect. And my book, you can both both books uh, can be found on Amazon, uh, Apple, iTunes, Barnes and Noble dot com, uh, both in Kindle and uh, book version. Fantastic. So. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, I would really encourage people to uh, check it out. For well, the first book is a very in-depth view of near-death experiences, where people who want to go deeper and understanding them, um, that's a great book. And then, of course, the one with the Jesus. There's no other book like it. So, uh, I would encourage people who are interested in Jesus, seeing Jesus in a new way. Uh, check out the book. Hmm. You know what you're leaving me with personally is that there is this love. And yes, when we have a near-death experience, but I'm getting it right amount around me right now that is not judgmental, just loves me completely, fully for who I am all along my journey. And we all have that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... Yes. Yeah. It left me with some profound thinking happening. That's why I got quiet so many times as I'm just kind of just trying it on like, and it's awe inspiring, you know, just to know that that love is around us. It's hard, Roy. I think lots of times we think we're all alone (laughs) on this adventure called life. Uh, if, if if I can add just sure. one quick thing from Julian in Norwich, who talked about love from Jesus. Yes. And she wrote, I was answered in spiritual understanding, and it was said, what do you wish to know your Lord's meaning in this thing? Know it well. Love was his meaning. Who reveals it to you? Love. What did he reveal to you? Love. Why did he reveal it to you? For love. Remain in this, and you will know more of the same. You will never know different without end. Beautiful. Yes. And there's nothing that feels better than love. Yes. Giving it, receiving it, sharing it, all of it. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Thank you. You're Roy. welcome. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Yeah. Um, everybody. I know our first conversation was fantastic. That's episode 98. Easy to go for anybody. We don't die radio.com and just scroll down to episode 98 uh, or you can listen on YouTube and iTunes and things like that. Really great. Uh, so just a reminder, we've been talking to Dr. Roy Hill and his website again is near death, 
www.royhoffman.com. And I want to thank him, obviously, again, for being here. It's really great, Roy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and for our listener, thank you for taking this hour and mapping this conversation onto your life, your beliefs, and hopefully allowing it to empower you in your life and your journey as a soul uh, in the, here in the school called Life. And just a reminder, uh, feel free to go to afterlifestudies.org to check out that September symposium in Scottsdale. I'd love to meet you there. And then also, you know, who do you discuss these kind of things with? Uh, I know in my own life, the closest people to me, uh, family and friends, are not all into this conversation of life after death like I am and searching for the meaning of life. And I love them, but they're not. So I'm excited to invite you to that Facebook group, We Don't Die Listeners, okay? Because they really would like to share with more people um, and just talk. So I think that would be great. So I invite you to do that. So in closing, my name's Sandra Champlain, and I've been delighted to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So I want to thank you again for listening, and we'll see you soon. Music.